Welcome to the Really Know Your Customer podcast with your hosts, Betsy Westhafer and Tony Bodo. Join Betsy and Tony as they dive in with highly successful C-suite leaders who have grown successful organizations by creating a laser focus on listening to their customers and building deep customer relationships. Now, it's time to join Betsy and Tony for the Really Know Your Customer show. Welcome to the Really Know Your Customer podcast. I'm Tony Boto, CEO of Tony Boto International. And I'm Betsy Westhaper, CEO of the Congruity Group. Betsy, I've got to tell you, I am so excited to bring our audience this particular episode. Uh, Chris Keeney, who we interview, is just an amazing individual and a brilliant mind. And I, I know our audience is going to really pick up on that as we go through this conversation. A couple of things that really stand out to me, and, and I want to bring these out so that the audience is listening for them, is his perspective of NPS or Net Promoter Score. It's a good tool. It's a great tool. But where do we go next? And really looking at combination of NPS and lifetime value and the, the, the value that customers really bring to the table, you know, with their wallets amongst another, other attributes and that into what he calls quantitative personas, which his new company, Rosemark, is actually developing and creating right now. Yeah, Tony, this was a great interview. I'm, I'm very excited also for the listeners to hear a lot of the concepts. The one, the one thing that jumped up to me um, in our conversation was this idea of dissolving the scene, which is a phrase I had not heard before. And it's really about how do you minimize that gap between you, your company and your customers. And, um, you know, as I mentioned that's something that we aspire to in the work that we do with customer advisory boards. How do you bring them into the fold and make them an extension of your team and by default dissolve the scene? So really excited to hear him expound on, on that concept as well. So with that, we are very, very happy to, Oh, go ahead, Tony. I'm sorry. I was going to say one of the things that makes us this show so great, Betsy, is I'm the analytical nerd looking at lifetime value and you're looking at the relationship of customers and companies. I love it. This is why we make such a good team. Exactly. I was thinking the same thing too, because the stuff that you nerd and geek out on is stuff that just goes right over my head. And then I get into the warm, fuzzy stuff and together it works really well. So yeah, I agree. Totally agree. Um, so with that, we are very, very happy to welcome Chris Keeney. He is the CEO of Rosemark. He's had a phenomenal career, very successful, done a lot of cool things that you'll get to hear about in this interview. So without further ado, we'd like to welcome Chris Keeney to the show. So yeah, let's go ahead and kick off the conversation. We're so excited to have Chris Keeney here with us today. Chris is the CEO and founder of Rosemark, which is based in Princeton, New Jersey. And we're just really excited. We have so much in common to talk about, especially as it relates to customers. So Chris, I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to you and ask you to just kind of give us your background and what led you to this point of where you are today. Sure, Betsy. Thanks. Uh, Betsy and Tony, thanks so much for inviting me onto your show. So um, I guess you could call me a dyed-in-the-wool consumer marketer. I started my career at Johnson & Johnson, where I rose up to be the franchise marketing director of the Band-Aid brand. Uh, so for those of you, your listeners who have children, I'm the guy responsible or accountable for putting decorations on Band-Aids. Uh, and then I moved on to uh, briefly run the adult Tylenol franchise, which was the largest business at J&J. While I was at Johnson & Johnson, which was about a 10-year period, I discovered a problem in the way market research was integrated with uh, marketing strategy for brands and decided to start my own firm called Rosetta, not the language company, but ultimately a business that was a digital marketing agency and technology company. And we built Rosetta from exactly $0 million on day one to $250 million on the day that we sold it to the publicist group for nearly $600 million. So since selling Rosetta, I've been busy writing books. I teach at Princeton, and I've now started a new company focused on the same basic principles of Rosetta, but focused on the customer marketing side of digital marketing, as opposed to the acquisition and customer marketing side. Uh, so I'm thrilled to share some thoughts and insights about how customer marketing works, at least how our, our view of it, 
and uh, hopefully uh, be helpful to your to your listeners. Chris, before you get started on that, I'm just curious, how did you get into the whole customer marketing thing? Like what led you to even prior to J&J that that gave you that passion for the work that you do? Yeah, um, I have a kind of a funny short story on this. So when I was in college, I was a history major and studied a lot of Victorian novel. And um, believe it or not, I believe that Victorian novel and customer marketing are very similar. Uh, And they're similar in in the fact that when you're reading a very complex novel, you're following the plot line and you're really trying to understand the characters deeply. And at the end of the day, actually, that's what marketing is all about, deeply understanding the complexities of your um, novel members or your, uh, let me try that again, deeply understanding uh, the characters in the novel. And uh, in marketing, it's really the characters in a marketplace. Um, So it was really just kind of a hop, skip and a jump from Victorian novel into marketing. I will just add one other thing. I was a faculty brat. My dad taught economics. And so I spent a lot of time around the dinner table understanding how econometric models actually began to understand uh, how markets work. So a little bit of economics, a little bit of Victorian novel and whiz bang. I was a marketer. I'm a history major, economics minor, so I'm going to say that history background of understanding how to analyze things and go after original research, that probably had a little play in there, too. <laughs> I, yeah, I think so. I think so. Just as a quick uh, aside, I'm a big believer that in your undergraduate career, you should study the humanities and social sciences. And then if you so choose, go to business school or law school or whatever. Uh, and in fact, the course that I teach at Princeton is on, on based on this very point. We have a lot of engineers uh, in the class, but at the same time, we're also got a lot of human, humanities students and bringing those two together uh, to crack uh, Harvard Business School cases is a wonderful way to uh, to really get to, to truth and, and better strategies. You know, it's so funny just tying these, connecting these dots, because my son was also a history major and is now a customer success director for a logistics yeah. company. So there Excellent. must be something to that. The uh, history as the, the precursor to a career in customer facing roles. Yeah, I would have said because we couldn't get a job elsewhere, but I don't think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's true either. Um, so, yeah, so let's talk about your customers, Chris, and tell us just a little bit about your business and who you're serving and how you're serving them. And just give us the whole rundown on the work you're doing now. Sure, Betsy. Thanks. Um, so we're in the very early stages of building out Rosemark um, at Rosetta. Uh, we built a consulting uh, business really focused on understanding consumers with an advanced uh, process that we call personality-based segmentation. Uh, and then from that base, we ended up acquiring and building the business out to, to be the size I talked about earlier. This time in building Rosemark, we're doing it in a slightly different way. We're starting with the IP. So we've built some intellectual property that we call quantitative personas, which I'll describe in a moment. And um, by combining uh, this method of deeply understanding your consumer, along with capital that we've lined up with from New Light Partners, a Soros fund, um, we are out actually acquiring businesses. And then we're gonna infuse those businesses uh, with the quantitative persona uh, technology. So um, we're in the early days of, um, of developing customers for quantitative persona and in the early days of looking at companies that we can acquire that will build out the platform. We're really looking for three different kinds of companies, uh, insight and strategy companies, because it all begins and ends with deeper customer insight. Um, Then data and analytics uh, companies that can convert um, what some people call the digital exhaust, those behaviors that are left behind uh, out on the internet. Um, and uh, uh, convert that into deeper insight. And then a loyalty um, platform that uh, ultimately is customer facing and provides um, loyalty and CRM capabilities based on the data, based on the consumer insights to drive lifetime value. So, so this we're is on mostly, a mission. Yeah, it sounds like it. So this is mostly in the B2C world. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And um, as we were talking about a little bit before the show, um, we have had a reasonable amount of experience in B2B. And of course, all of our clients are businesses, but they're businesses that for the most part uh, serve the consumer as opposed to other, um, other businesses. 
So talk a little bit more about this idea of quantitative personas. I know you took us through this before the show, um, but really diving into that because I, and I've got some follow-up questions just based on what you shared with us just briefly. Sure. Sure. Thanks for the question, Tony. So um, it turns out that um, we really can uh, with the right questions, I'll call it the right questions and the right math. um, We really can discern how the softer parts of who we are as people actually drive our economic behaviors for a potential brand. So let me illustrate. Um, In the quick serve restaurant uh, and fast casual restaurant business, where we built one of these QP models, we can understand how your motivations and your preferences, which I'll define in a moment, actually drive your decision to go out to eat where you go to eat, how you divide your stomach, as it's known, share of stomach across different um, quick serve restaurant brands, whether you tend to use the app or whether you like to sit in the restaurant and socialize with your friends and family. So what we are able to do is take these sort of softer, what are often known as psychometric measures and explicitly connect them to purchase behaviors and understand how your motivations actually drive your behaviors. Um, This is particularly important now where a lot of the behavioral modeling, in other words, looking at point of sale data or loyalty data and guessing what your intention is, most of that's actually played out. So for brands who are looking for an edge against their competition, they need to go to the next step beyond just the point of sale data and into the motivations and preferences. And that's really what quantitative personas do. So it essentially gets to this why behind the what, because most quantitative research in the past has always been about what behavior has happened, but they could never really define the why behind it, which you might go to qualitative research like ethnography or uh, focus groups or or anything of that nature. Um, But your quantitative method really gives a different approach here than is what you're saying. That's an excellent way to say it, Tony. In fact, uh, you use the very phrase we do, the the why behind the what. Um, And certainly focus groups and ethnographic studies are really great ways on a sort of qualitative or um, one-off broad-based understanding. But the problem with a focus group or uh, an ethnographic study is you can't actually score your database to understand you know, the reds, the blues, the greens, the, in, in our language, the quantitative persona, one, two, three. So our method is designed to do some of the same discernment as the qualitative side, but this is the reason we call, call it quantitative personas, um, that we're able to actually build a model based on uh, consumers' behaviors observed through point of sale and other uh, data on them individually and predict not perfectly, but predict at a fairly high level of accuracy what their quantitative persona is. So it allows us to translate what you might learn in an ethnographic study into really um, the marketing automation stack and all the magic that's been developed over the last 15 years to scale uh, personalized marketing. So Chris, what are your thoughts on some of the other things that are out there, such as NPS and some of these other ways to to measure that? I'd really be interested because I think a lot of times we hear two different schools of thought on that. So I'd be really interested in hearing what you think about that. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much for the question, Betsy. And I'm smiling ear to ear as you reference NPS because I'm actually working on an article right now on that exact topic. So um, Net Promoter Score was genius. You know, it's genius because it's um, simple. It's genius because it's been adopted because it's simple. And it's a very powerful way, we believe, to measure the overall health of the relationship between your brand and your customer. So terrific, terrific tool. And it's incredibly simple. Um, And it's now become sort of part of the tool chest or the vernacular of the way um, customer marketing companies uh, think. Um, There are a couple issues where um, NPS is not the complete story. Uh, And of course, it's not the complete story, not because it's NPS's fault. It's just that NPS didn't go out to try to solve the next problem. And we believe the next problem is that whenever you look at customer cohorts, however you analyze them, we use quantitative persona to 
put people into these distinct groups. You see that every brand has a very dramatic profit skew. So let me illustrate. In retail banking, you know, checking accounts, savings accounts, everybody always talks about the Pareto rule or the 80-20, you know, 20% of your customers or 80% of your business. In retail financial services, the top 20% of your customers are about 300% of your profit, which means that there are a whole lot of customers that are underwater. So one of the things that's missing from NPS not because, uh, let me try that again. One of the things that NPS does not do, and frankly, it wasn't built to do, is to understand the value of the customer who's giving you the NPS rating for your brand. And so it's our uh, theory that you need to profit stratify. In other words, understand the profit tiers of your NPS scores because there's a danger in going out and getting a low NPS, going off and doing something that's probably very expensive to change in your customer marketing or your customer experience to solve a problem for customers who actually are not valuable or perhaps even worse, maybe unprofitable for you. So it's our, uh, uh, it's our conjecture, and we're doing research on this now, that the best way to leverage NPS is to really understand what the drivers of NPS are and what the um, profit strata is within each NPS score. And so hopefully over the next 12 months, we'll have QP, quantitative persona, as a de-averaging method for NPS. So which QPs have higher and lower NPS scores and therefore which QPs actually are contributing uh, to your enterprise value, in other words, profitability, and which may not be. I, I was just going to say, I find that really interesting. Um, a lot of the work that I've been able to do with companies for the last 10 or 12 years, you know, we lay out, we look at the qualitative, the feedback on the surveys as an example. And we have a particular methodology where we lay out things like profitability of the customer segments, right? So we, we look at what type of feedback they have. We look at the profitability they have, and we begin to create these these segmentations. And then again, just like you've said, we recognize that lifetime value is really a driver that we have to look at for these businesses. And there are some businesses, I, I won't name brands, but I was in conversations with them and they would say, well, we just need to improve customer satisfaction. I said, well, why yeah. don't you make your product free then? They're like, well, <laughs> we can't do that. Yeah. Well, your customers would be happy, you know? And, and then they, they kind of start to get the point of lifetime value and satisfaction. You have to link the two of them. So I love this approach that you're taking and I can't wait to see the results of that. Yeah, thank you, Tony. I, I love the point you're making. This is not um, uh, customer satisfaction at, at all costs, your example, right? It's customer satisfaction among those consumers or customers who are aligned with your brand proposition for whom you can have more value, add more value to them or serve them better than your competitors can. And so there's this kind of stair-step thing that says, what's my NPS for whom, why, and now what do I do about it? Not just what's my NPS, I better go, go fix that problem. I, I really like like this. I, I just ran across a situation not too long ago in my own work. I was talking with someone and they got one piece of feedback and said, oh, we need to we need to do something about that. We need to change that. And and just taking a little bit and making big decisions based on something that may or may not even be valuable or relevant, it just may or profitable to your point is it just makes so much sense to me. Um, Chris, talk to us a little bit about your what you're doing. I'm, I'm fascinated by the work you're doing at Princeton. Um, I'm a mentor in the entrepreneurship class at the University of Dayton, and I just love working with these right. students. So I'd love to have you expound a little bit on the, on what you're doing at Princeton and who you're working with and what you're seeing with these students and what kind of got you compelled to do that. Sure. Thank you. Uh, first, every time I stand in front of the class, I think, oh, my gosh, I won the lottery. Here I am in front of these amazingly brilliant and highly energetic students. Um, and one of my jokes with my colleagues is that I think the students are learning faster than we're teaching them, uh, which is a polite <laughs> way of saying it's so much more about them than it is about us. Um, but thank, thank you for the question. It's one of the things I enjoy most in each of my weeks. So I teach a course called High Tech Entrepreneurship. 
Uh, and the course is focused on how you think about going from an idea to a scaled business that is technology driven. Um, and so we step through literally each of the elements of how you do that. So from the minimum viable product um, to the growth hypothesis, uh, to building teams, uh, to operating in an ecosystem. I even do a little uh, lesson. In fact, it's this week on uh, the form of segmentation we just talked about. Um, and then ultimately how you finance growth uh, and then how you exit. Um, and so it's, uh, it's enormously fun. I've been doing it. This is the beginning of my ninth year teaching this class. Um, and I'm just uh, so proud of, of the students we have and uh, frankly, how much I learn. I feel like I should be the one paying the tuition because <laughs> I learned so much from them. There are certain, it's, it's the, the class is based on Harvard Business School cases um, to work through each of these elements. And so some of these cases I've taught 16, 17 times, which some might feel it's like, geez, how do you do that? But I have to tell you with brilliant kids, you learn something new every single time you go through the case. And the other thing is that the world's changing so quickly that the context in which they think about the case from three years ago or five years ago or even eight years ago versus today is dramatically different. Um, so hopefully uh, we'll spawn a few successful entrepreneurs. And um, because Princeton is a liberal arts uh, university, um, most importantly, I hope that um, understanding a little bit more about how entrepreneurship works is part of a, what I would believe is a part of a good education. So how do we audit your course then? Because I really that's what I was going to ask. I was just thinking, I want to take this class. <laughs> uh, that's that's very flattering. Yeah, I've, I actually I've been I haven't been involved in Coursera or any of the MOOC things, but I am thinking about maybe taking two or three of the cases or classes and try to create a little mini course for people to to watch online. So. Uh, I'll let you guys know if we get to that step. Like you guys, you know, there's never enough time to chase after all the things you'd love to do. I, I find it really fascinating. Um, one of the things that Betsy and I, we're, we're working on our second book, but it you, you've written books, you understand, you know, working on a book could take 10 years, right? Um, we've, as we've talked to different CEOs in this podcast, we have seen, because we look at different stages of the, of the life cycle, we don't take a particular uh, stage or size of company typically. And what we've been able to determine is there's a different way to listen at each stage of the company. And so that's why it would be, it would be interesting to see how your course unfolds and then tie that to the whole aspect of how to listen to your customer at every stage of that growth cycle. That is a wonderful phrase. There's a different way to listen at each. I've never heard it quite, or I, I completely agree, but that's really quite an elegant way to say it. There's a different way to listen at each stage. Can you give me an example? Because I, 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 that really resonates with me, but I'd love to hear more about how you guys approach that. Yeah, so if you take a, a pre-startup, someone who's just thinking about an idea, we had we interviewed a gentleman so he started out with this idea because he he was an army ranger and he trained uh, the, the rangers how to scale the the cliffs and so he noticed that the rope you know protector that they use which was like a, an old hose or something like that would tear and they almost lost the man on his under his command because of the the rope uh, started to tear and so he came up with this idea so in the initial phase as we we're listening to different entrepreneurs it's, it's like just kind of listening to the environment, listening to what's happening yeah. out there. And then, and then it's listening to yourself. What would I need? What would I love? Right. And then very quickly, as you move into that garage stage, you start to listen to who would my core customers be? Let me go listen to them. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of progresses into, okay, now I need to listen to who's going to be the purchasing agent or the decision maker. Right. And, and th in that early stage, that first year or so of, of really developing an idea or two years, you switch between who you listen to very quickly. And if you don't, you're going to miss the ability to really sell your product and get into um, the, the first stage of scaling, which is kind of coming out of your garage, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a terrific metaphor. And in fact, relates to what we were just talking about, because if you're over listening to your unprofitable, low NPS customers, you could end up you know, heading in the wrong direction. Um, and another sort of aspect of what you just said that um, connects directly to the course I teach, um, one of the texts we use in addition to the book John Dan and I wrote 
um, is called Crossing the Chasm. And it is really brilliant. Um, and Crossing the Chasm speaks to exactly the point you're talking about in terms of how you using your terminology, how you listen to different cohorts who adopt technology at different rates. And the major aha from that work is that the cohorts themselves are not referential to one another. In other words, the early adopters are actually not references for the early majority. The early majority has to come upon learning about the product and to take away the, the hurdles of adoption on its own, as opposed to actually listening to the early adopters. So this idea of who's listening to whom, when, um, is, uh, I think is a wonderful way to think about this. Chris, what's on the radar? I mean, I what what's your big vision for where you want to take the company, what you want to achieve, what you know, what you're really focused on um, yeah. in the in the long term? Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, I um, I'm definitely uh, an innovator, uh, and in the terminology of um, of our book, I'm a driver. Um, uh, the book we wrote was about different types of um, of entrepreneurs, um, and so I'll start sort of internally using my own uh, drink, drinking my own medicine here. Um, so, what makes me tick, and then I'll play that into what what I'm doing. What makes me tick is identifying a market gap, uh, and then really obsessing over this idea of product market fit. So, we believe we're on to um, the next major issue of product market fit in marketing technology and insights. Um, and we've touched on this a little bit, but um, I'll start from the beginning. And that is that um, customer marketing. So this is not acquiring customers. This is deepening your relationship with existing customers. Uh, Fred Reichold, who's really quite a famous um, uh, pundit on this and, and uh, consultant at Bain, uh, was probably the first one to really measure that a dollar spent against your customer has about five times the return uh, versus a dollar spent on the market to acquire a new customer. And it's our belief that this is going to further be further accentuated as the rules and regulations around first party data get tighter. And so being able to convert insights out of first party data into deepening your customer relationships, we believe is the next major wave in digital and for that matter, all of marketing. So we have a rather bold uh, objective, which is to build from scratch the next leader in customer marketing based on what we've talked about before. In other words, converting these insights about the customer into more effective relationship marketing that deepens the relationship and ultimately drives lifetime value. So if we're successful, two or three things will happen. First, at every analyst meeting, um, when the Wall Street analysts are asking a CEO of a customer consumer driven business um, how it's did last quarter, one of the first questions will be, how did the lifetime value of your customers advance or decline in the last quarter? Because we believe lifetime value combined with net, uh, net promoter score is actually one of the most pure ways of determining the financial implications of whether your brand and your process and your services are actually enhancing um, the relationship with the customer. In other words, they're buying more and they're generating more profit for the shareholders. So that's one sort of meta level goal. Uh, the more um, sort of down to earth goal is um, we, we intend to build a business of three, four, five hundred million dollars in revenue that's entirely focused on enabling the largest marketers in the world to actually do that. Break that down into the pieces, provide both the services and the technology that allow um, big brands uh, to measure, manage, and optimize lifetime value over time so they can give that CEO uh, the right information to be able to tell Wall Street why uh, the stock price should be higher. So I'm going to ask you, ask you uh, a question that wasn't on our kind of agenda here. What's your why behind doing this? I'm really curious because you are, you are lit up about this topic. So what really drives that behind the scenes? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I guess sort of two or three things. Um, the, the first one is um, <laughs> we mentioned this at the top of the show that um, growing up as the son of an economics professor, you, uh, you know, it's sort of like you don't get dessert if you haven't made some interesting comment about supply and demand or how econometric models <laughs> work. Uh, and so um, I would say that, you know, uh, built into my very sort of nerve and sinew of who I am is an intellectual curiosity about how things work. Um, 
I think one way of describing customer marketing, whether it's in the B2B or B2C arena, is that the goal is to dissolve the seam between the customer and the company. So in this kind of uh, almost thought construct, if your customer, if your company understood your customer as, as if the customer were in the company, that company would grow far faster. So I think part of the drive is just a pure intellectual curiosity about that's a neat theory. Can we actually make that work? And so quantitative personas and the other things we've been talking about are methods and processes that begin to dissolve the seam between the customer and the company. Um, this, the second reason is, um, is deeply philosophical and, and emotional for me. Um, after selling Rosetta, um, I um, ma made enough money to not really have to work anymore. And so you look at yourself and say, you know, why am I going to spend all this time um, earning money? And um, all the money that I make going forward will go to a foundation um, while I've been very lucky in my professional career, I've been very unlucky in my personal life. Um, my five and a half year old daughter, Olivia, was killed in a terrible freak accident um, now 24 years ago. And then two years ago, my wife died of ovarian cancer. And so um, I'm working to put money into a foundation uh, to uh, memorialize their love of uh, art. And so the um, Olivia and Leslie Rainbow Foundation is the destination for all the winnings of what, um, what we do in this round. So there's an intellectual uh, drive part of it. And then there's a very strong emotional desire to memorialize my uh, late daughter and my late wife. Oh, Chris, so sorry to hear that that's happened. Um, but what a what a wonderful way to to bring something good from from a, a really tragic situation. Um, you know, when you were talking about art, I had the the good fortune to go to the art uh, exhibit at Princeton, and um, it was it. I'll never forget it. it. Was such a great experience. So I'm sure you have spent more than a day or two in there. Yes, yes. You're talking about the uh, Princeton Art Museum. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. It's spectacular. And in fact, Princeton's now building a new museum on that very site. So uh, make sure you come back in three years because it's going to be even more amazing. Yeah, it was it. It knocked my socks off. It was absolutely yeah. spectacular. Um, well, Chris, what else would you like for our listeners to know about you, about um, the work you're doing, any, anything else you want to put out there or anything that our listeners can do to support your efforts? Sure. Thank you. Um, so I'm very proud of my younger sister. Um, uh, her name is Carolyn Jepson, and she has started a foundation or a, a nonprofit um, called Broad Futures, and she's committed her um, a later part of her career to helping um, uh, young people on the spectrum become mainstreamed and economically uh, uh, productive. So she, uh, uh, every year, uh, touches about 40 or 50 young people between about 18 and 25 and helps them get internships and build the skills so that they can have full-time jobs. Um, and so I'm just so proud of my sister, Carolyn, and the organization that she's built uh, called Broad Futures. Awesome. We will put a link to um, Broad Futures in the show notes as well. So very, very good to know about that, because I think that's um, obviously something that touches a lot of families. And um, yes. so, yeah, absolutely happy to share that. Tony, any other final questions for Chris? Uh, I think I've asked every question I can come up with. I mean, this is Chris. This has been an amazing uh, opportunity to just chat with you and um I, I look forward to having you back on the show down the road as you make more progress. And, and I'd love to hear where things go for you. Great, Tony. Thanks so much. And Tony and Betsy, thanks for the honor to join you on your show. Uh, I've listened to a number of your podcasts in preparation, and I'm just so impressed with the guests you have and the way you help them tell their stories. So thank you for that. And thank you for the chance to do it here. Oh, thank you, Chris. We really appreciate it. And we do want to stay in touch. Absolutely. We, you know, Tony, you said you've asked all your questions. I'm thinking I have 9,000 more questions. That I want to ask. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have time for that, but um, definitely would love to stay in touch, Chris. And um, thank you again for joining us. This has been a, just an awesome conversation. Great. Thank you guys. Have a great day. Take care. Betsy, I know I say this after every show, but this was amazing. Um, 
I absolutely love just sitting here listening to Chris. I want to sit in his classroom and go through that For course sure. that he has because his mind is just brilliant. The way he sees the world, the way he sees, if you will, the evolution of brand strategy and customer segmentation to this idea of quantitative personas, it, it blows my mind. I mean, I understand where he's going. I know I'm not at the level he's at, but I understand where he's going with it. And it blows my mind to see what might be possible in the very near future with quantitative personas and this idea that he's bringing forth. Yeah. And he, he clearly is a visionary and innovator, a driver, all of those things that he mentioned um, in a very, in a very humble way, I might add. Uh, yes. But he is definitely all of those things. And it's, to me, it's very inspiring to think that people like that, that have been there, done it, don't have to work that hard anymore, are giving back by teaching this class, working with these young moldable minds, um, really sharing what he's learned along his journey, I find to be extremely inspiring. And um, yeah, I just feel very honored that he was uh, a guest on our show. Absolutely. All right. Well, that does it for another episode of the Really Know Your Customer podcast. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Really Know Your Customer. We hope you gained a lot of value from being here today. If you want to learn more about the work Betsy and Tony do to help their clients thrive, visit Betsy at thecongruitygroup.com and Tony at tonybodo.com. See you next time on the Really Know Your Customer show.